Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing day. We have no shortage of news to get through today, so we're going to start things off with several pieces of AMD news, the first of which concerns the RX 5300 and the B550 motherboards. And this information comes to us via some leaks from HP computers. This is actually not the first time that HP have done an oopsie and have accidentally leaked the existence of unannounced products. So the specifications are on HP's own website, although they are limited, and that's putting it mildly. What we can tell is that the RX 5300 XT is a 4GB model and will sport GDDR5 memory. So, technically speaking, this is the first GDDR5 model in the RX 5000 series, which also brings us to the inevitable question, what architecture is this? I'll be looking at a Polaris-based GPU, or would this be an RDNA-based GPU, but with a radically different memory controller? Unfortunately, we don't have enough information yet. Uh, digging through driver entries doesn't help either. As of the time that I'm recording this, which is uh, the 23rd 09 2019, there are no entries which would give us a hint of what we could be seeing. However, the shipping date of these systems is October, early October at that, so it's not too long into the future that we'll actually learn more about what the RX 5300 XT could be. I'm really hoping it's not another Polaris rebrand, because, oh boy, we've had so many Polaris rebrands. Uh, it's beyond the meme at this point. It's actually as bad as uh, NVIDIA and the original um, 8000 series, if you remember back in the days of the GeForce 8800s, and then we saw like multiple rebrands, goodness, that was bad as well. Anyway, the other really interesting thing about this HP pre-built system is that we also learn of the existence of the B550 motherboards. Well, I say existence of, we kind of knew that they were coming, uh, these are going to be, of course, aimed at the mid-range systems and will be designed to accompany uh, Ryzen 3000 CPUs, uh, such as processors like the Ryzen 5 3500X. There was actually a leak thanks to HKEPC, which detailed the differences between the B550 chipset as well as the X570 chipset. You can see what they are yourself, so I'm not going to read out all of them. But primarily, this comes down to I.O. So, for example, we see a radical cut in the number of USB 3.2 connections, whereas USB 2.0, which everyone loves, has been increased to 6 rather than just 4. Uh, SATA is 4 plus 4 rather than 4 plus 8. The uplink uh, is now times 4 Gen 3 compared to times 4 time, uh, Gen 4. And for PCIe lanes, we also have 8 Gen 2 plus 4 Gen 3 for the B550 compared to uh, 8 plus 8 Gen 4s on the X570. But the rest of the stuff looks pretty consistent, as you can see for yourself. However, that's certainly not the end of AMD news. We also have the AMD Radeon RX 5500. This has been spotted on a GFX Bench, Graphics Bench, and we have uh, a couple of different listings in terms of the specifications for GFX Bench 5 as well as 4. Unfortunately, in terms of performance, it's quite difficult to actually ascertain just how this GPU performs because... Well, most of the tests were either failed or didn't run, but nevertheless, at least it's a good sign that we are getting closer to the RX 5500. There's also a lot of questions which are being asked at the moment regarding Narve 12 as well as Narve 14, specifically what the performance targets of these GPUs are. Now we've seen the RX 5300, we've seen the RX 5500, so... Obvious questions include what the heck the difference is, 
uh, in terms of the final specifications of these GPUs, what the architecture of the RX 5300 is going to be, what on earth has happened to the RX 5600, for example, are AMD just going to be not doing that? So they're going to be going like a Ryzen approach. Remember that with the Ryzen's, you've got like the Ryzen 5, blah, you've got Ryzen 7, blah, Ryzen 9, blah. So are they going to be doing much the same with the Radeon GPUs? And also, at any point in the next, you know, 200 years, are they going to release an RDNA GPU which has more shaders than what we have with the RX 5700 XT? So there was hope, of course, that the Nave 12 GPU would be that, but unfortunately, so far, there just hasn't been any leaks which really back this up, other than a couple of things we saw a couple of months ago, but all of the recent leaks seem to indicate GPUs that are coming out which are smaller than uh, the RX 5700 XT. So hopefully we learn more about that in the coming weeks. And next up, the president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, Jim Ryan, has said that the next generation PlayStation, the PS5, is going to be extremely power efficient, particularly while on standby. This was via a blog as PlayStation joins forces with the United Nations to combat climate change. I'm going to read out the uh, blog verbatim. At SCI, we have made substantial commitments and efforts to reduce the power consumption of the PS4 by utilizing efficient technologies such as system-on-chip architecture, integrating to a high-performance graphics processor, die shrink, power scaling, as well as energy-saving modes such as suspend to RAM. For context, we estimate the carbon emissions we have avoided today already amount to 16 million metric tons, increasing to 29 million metric tons over the course of the next 10 years, which equals to the CO2 emission of the nation of Denmark in 2017. So what he's referring to here is the PS4 only, nothing to do with the PS5. He's referencing the uh, APU system on a chip architecture, and also the fact that the PS4 has undergone a die shrink. There's also uh, efforts for uh, from Sony to be able to suspend your game and uh, obviously save it locally to RAM and so on and so on. But then he moves on to the discussion of the next generation PlayStation. He says, and I quote, I'm also very pleased to announce that the next generation PlayStation console will also include the possibility to suspend gameplay with a much lower power consumption than PS4, which we estimate can be achieved at around half a watt. If so, if just 1 million users enable this feature, it would save the equivalent to the average electricity of a thousand United States homes. And from an operations point of view, we will complete our carbon footprint assessment of our gaming services and will report the energy efficiency measures we employ at our data centers. We are committed to informing consumers of energy efficient console setup and so on. And then they continue by mentioning things such as energy efficiency for later hardware and, well, you can read it yourself on screen. It's going to be very fascinating to see what that actually means for the PS5. So the PS4, depending upon the usage scenario and the variant of PlayStation that you're uh, referring to, so not only the launch model, the PS4 Pro and the PS4 Slim, but also different iterations of the PlayStation because it's gone through so many different revisions, slightly tweak the amount of power, and then of course the software it's running. So not only do you have different power requirements, say with Netflix versus a Blu-ray, but you also have different power being sucked up depending upon the game. So, for example, a small 2D brawler that you're playing on your PlayStation is not going to be as taxing as, say, I don't know, uh, God of War, right? That's just pretty obvious. So, on average, a PlayStation 4 hits around 140, 150, sometimes a little bit more in terms of wattage, but that is considerably less if you are streaming a game. So it's going to be really fascinating to see what happens with the next generation PlayStation and just how many energies it's going to be sucking from the wall. Next up we have Intel as CPU architect Jim Keller discusses what the design goals are for Willow Cove and other subsequent processors from Intel. These will of course succeed Sunny Cove. 
Intel have been under an immense amount of pressure thanks to AMD's Zen 2 CPU architecture, and it's kind of ironic given Jim Keller himself had such a hand in the design of the original Zen processors. According to lead architect Jim Keller, the next generation CPU architecture from the company, just to be clear, this is not Sunny Cove, will be significantly bigger and also closer to the linear curve in terms of performance. So Sunny Cove is, of course, the successor to Skylake, and it's pretty impressive so far. But according to Jim Keller, they are working, that's Intel, working on a subs subsequent architecture which will be considerably more powerful. In fact, they're touting a 50 times increase in transistors his team are aiming for. Uh, this is over the next few years. So Sunny Cove, we know, has around a 15-18% to 18 IPC boost uh, compared to Coffee Lake of the equivalent speed. But despite that, we also have a 38% increase in the per-core transistor count. So Coffee Lake had around 217 million 14NM transistors, but according to Jim Keller, Ice Lake has 300 million 10 nm transistors that's a lot of transistors but according to a discussion at berkeley this discussion by the way is on youtube and is titled moore's law is not dead this is a subject that jim has been very passionate about uh, actually uh, Jim spoke about the evolution of microarchitectures. He began, of course, back all the way in Intel's 8080 days and then uh, started to discuss more uh, recent architectures such as Sunny Cove, which powers Ice Lake. But then he began to discuss newer architectures, and this is a quote from Jim. Sunny Cove has 800 instruction window, sustains around, but sorry, sustains between 3 and 6 x86 instructions per clock. Massive data predictors, massive branch predictors. We are working on a generation that's significantly bigger than this and close to the linear curve on performance. According to his thoughts on Moore's Law, he says lots of people say, well, hey, we're hitting some kind of limit. I really doubt it. We have a roadmap to 50 times more transistors and a huge steps every single piece of the stack. Remember, computers are built by large numbers of people, but actually... Many small teams, better prediction, better instruction sets, architecture, better optimization, better CAD tools, better libraries. The number of different places that we are doing for innovation is really, really high. Uh, and so Jim Keller, if you recall, has jumped around quite a number of times. He actually was working at AMD and he was instrumental in the design of Zen. Uh, but then obviously he left. He was even at Tesla for a while. But now as it is at Intel, and I do highly respect his knowledge because at the end of the day, he's kind of well well known in the industry, and that's putting it extremely mildly. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens architecturally over the next few years. While, yes, technically speaking, it is getting harder and harder to shrink down the process, there are ways around that, including things such as 3D stacking and chiplets, which obviously... Uh, we are see seeing being used rather well, particularly by AMD right now with the Zen architecture. Uh, Zen 2 has done a really good job with the chiplet side of things. But we also have technologies like Intel's Foveros, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's just going to be really interesting to see what happens. I'm very much looking forward to what we're going to be seeing from uh, Willow Cove, which is the architecture directly after Sunny Cove. So according to the CPU core roadmap from Intel... Sunny Cove focused on single thread performance, a new ISA, and scalability is improved. And then we have Willow Cove, which was a cache redesign, new transistor optimization, and security features. A couple of days ago, I don't remember how long, maybe a week, I can't remember. It's all rolling into one with so many leaks recently. But around a week ago, less than a week ago, I did cover a piece of news that Willow Cove does definitely have a much larger cache layout. It has around 50% additional cash compared to even Sunny Cove. So obviously AM, uh, sorry, Intel are hitting their roadmap targets here. Uh, Golden Cove is the architecture which exceeds Willow Cove and that focuses on single thread performance as well as AI. Also security and features 
But that's a very loose term, like what exactly is a security feature. Um, and then also network and 5G performance, which isn't surprising as there's so much focus at the moment on 5G from just about everyone. I'm pretty certain at this point you're going to buy like, I don't know, a Frisbee and it's going to have 5G on it. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how all of this uh, ends up against one another because... But I also covered a leak just recently from one of my exclusive sources, and this seems to be backed up by a statement from AMD themselves uh, from their roadmap that says that uh, Zen 3 is going to be very similar to Intel's uh, Sunny Cove in terms of energy efficiency. So I suspect this is going to be really cool in 2020, just how both of these companies are going to be competing. And with any luck at all, both are going to have ab absolutely amazing products because at the end of the day, that just benefits us as consumers. Anyway, with any luck at all... Anyway, with any luck at all, you've enjoyed today's video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment and subscribe because it helps us out a ton. You can also find us on social media, which is linked down there below, and also Amazon affiliate links as well as Patreon. Don't feel you have to, but if you are buying you know, something like a new TV or whatever, and you decide to use one of the Amazon affiliate links, it does provide us a few pennies, which of course does help out with the costs of running the channel. But I wish you all a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.